Welcome to your end, video note 7.3. So we're doing these three major things in this video notes. I highlighted the new vocabulary that we haven't talked about yet. Everything else we've already done. So here we go. Evaporation is not boiling. What? Evaporation is a liquid change into a gas, and boiling is a liquid change into a gas, but they're not the same thing. So when you get out of a swimming pool, do you say, oh, the water boiled off of you, or do you say evaporated off of you? This one, so what's the difference? Okay, so evaporation can occur at any temperature. Molecules can escape the top of a liquid at any temperature, um, but that doesn't mean they're boiling. So it occurs at the surface, and there's no bubbles formed throughout the, the liquid. Okay, it's just the, temp, the top molecules at the surface taking their energy and going away. Okay, boiling occurs at a different temperature. It's called the boiling point. It occurs everywhere within the liquid, and then bubbles appear because anywhere in the liquid, Molecules can turn to gas. We'll keep defining it. Okay, so let's look at it, a, a visual of it, evaporation. So this is a liquid. There's no bubbles formed in the bottom of it because these molecules down here cannot turn into a gas. Once at the surface, though, if they absorb enough energy, they can turn into a gas and evaporate. Boiling, on the other hand, um, molecules at the surface and molecules anywhere in the liquid can turn into a gas. So you'll see bubbles here. Because some of these molecules turn into gas, you'll see um, molecules, we might not see them, but molecules from the surface can also turn, also turn into the gas. Okay, So one other thing that we're looking at here is when molecules turn into a gas, they're vapor, those molecules hit stuff. Okay, So that causes vapor pressure. So um, when the... Um, and then also there's air molecules. Those are going to be air molecules. There's always air molecules, right? So air molecules have pressure. Molecules from the liquid that turn into a gas have pressure. And so when can boiling happen? Boiling can happen when the air pressure molecules equal the molecules of the vapor coming off the liquid. Then uh, every molecule in the liquid can turn into a gas. Okay. So what is boiling? Boiling is when the air pressure equals the vapor pressure from the liquid. Because then... Every molecule in the liquid can get enough potential to turn into a gas. So we have to talk about atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure are the molecules of air hitting stuff. So if you're way up here, there's not a lot of molecules hitting stuff. So then the water can have the same vapor pressure as the atmospheric pressure at a lower temperature. Okay. Now water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. 212 Fahrenheit at sea level. But as you go higher into the atmosphere, there's less air pressure, so that means there has to be less vapor pressure in order for it to boil. So the temperature of boiling can decrease if the atmospheric pressure decreases. So here's another picture of it. If you're down here near sea level, this air pressure is higher because there's more air molecules hitting stuff. Um, 101 kilopascals is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury, which is equal to one atmosphere of pressure. And that's called um, uh, sea level, pressure at sea level, or normal pressure. Okay, one atmosphere, 101 kilopascals, 700 millimeters of mercury. That's usually what we call sea level. Okay, but as you go higher, less gas, less pressure. Uh, way up here, when there's no gas, there's no pressure. Okay, so if you have a liquid that's trying to turn into a gas, down here, there has to be the same pressure from the liquid molecules that have evaporated as there is from the atmosphere molecules in order to boil. Okay. So here's a graph that represents some different liquids and their vapor pressure. What is vapor pressure? Pressure caused by evaporated liquid. Okay. So pentane's vapor pressure is here. Notice as the temperature goes up, the vapor pressure goes up. That happens for all of the liquids, okay? So when can these liquids boil? Well, when the pressure from the atmosphere equals the vapor pressure, it's going to start boiling. This is normal atmospheric pressure, 760 millimeters of, the per of mercury equals one atmosphere of pressure equals um, 101 kilopascals or 101.3. All of these are equal. They're just different units, but they mean the same thing. So um, when 
the pressure of the vapor of the liquid equals the pressure of the atmosphere, that's when boiling can happen, okay? The boiling point for pentane at atmospheric pressure of one is 36.1 degrees Celsius. The boiling point of tetrachloromethane is 76.5 76 um, degrees Celsius. And the boiling point of water at one atmosphere is 100 degrees Celsius because that's the temperature when the atmosphere pressure pushing down on the liquid is equal to the vapor pressure coming off the liquid. Okay, so what does this tell you about intermolecular forces? Well, the lower the vapor pressure, the stronger the molecules are held together, and so the stronger the forces. So it looks like water has pretty strong intermolecular forces compared to these other two liquids. Okay, so real definition time. You probably think of boiling as a liquid turning to a gas. That's true, but it has to happen at the boiling point, and the boiling point depends on the atmosphere. So the real definition of boiling point is when the vapor pressure coming from the liquid is equal to the pressure pushing down on the liquid from the atmosphere. There's something called normal boiling point. And normal boiling point is the temperature when the vapor pressure equals the atmospheric pressure of 1 atm. So that's sea level atmospheric pressure is 1 atm. So when the vapor pressure equals 1 atmosphere, uh, one atmosphere then that's called the normal boiling point. So water's normal boiling point is 100 degrees Celsius because that's the temperature when the vapor pressure of water equals the atmospheric pressure of 1 atm. So if you've ever seen a pressure cooker, what happens in a pressure cooker is that there's high atmospheric pressure inside the pressure cooker. So um, the liquid doesn't boil at the same temperature it does when there's not that high pressure. So the... Um, um, liquid stays liquid longer because there's a higher pressure on it, okay? A lower pressure means a temperature, a lower temperature is needed to boil, okay? So that being said, that's a lot about boiling point and what it really means, okay? So we're going to switch gears. When we switch gears, we're going to talk about heat transfer. How do we know heat transfer? Well, you know heat transferred from a hot stove into your hand when you feel the burn, right? Ah, okay. So um, the way we can trap heat or detect heat transfer is that heat will flow from high heat to low heat, okay? So if um, one system has high heat, it's going to flow into another system that has low heat. So the heat loss from one system is going to equal the heat gained from another system, and heat flows from high to low. So key idea for um, detecting heat is that the heat loss by one thing equals the heat gained by another thing. So we use a technique called calorimetry. It's a lab technique. And this lab technique allows us to detect heat flowing and then calculate the amount of heat. Okay, so how do you detect heat flowing? Well, if something's, if heat's flowing from something to something else, its temperature is going to change or its phase is going to change. But we like to keep it in the normal um, range so that the phase doesn't change. So if I take a piece of hot metal and I put it into cold water, your instinct will probably tell you that the temperature of the water is going to go up and the temperature of the metal is going to go down. And you know that heat is done transferring when the temperature evens out. Temperature evens out when heat flow has stopped. Heat flow has stopped. Okay. So what that means is if I take a piece of hot metal and put it in this container, Take the temperature of the water before and the temperature of the water after. Um, take the temperature of the metal before and the temperature of the metal after. They're going to be the same temp after because heat flow stops and they get to the same temp. And so the heat lost by the metal okay, is going to be equal to the heat gained by the water. So we can calculate stuff like the mass of a, of a metal or we can calculate the specific heat of a metal or you can calculate the change in temperature of a metal if we know some other stuff. So Q of water equals Q of metal because the heat from the metal goes into the water. How much heat? The same, they equal each other. Okay, so more calorimetry. So you don't have to just use metals. They have what are called bomb calorimeters and you have this inside container. What's going on here is a chemical reaction. Chemical reaction. Right. And what's going on out here is some water. Okay. So inside this container, you've got a chemical reaction producing heat. 
Where does that heat go? That heat goes into the water. So what we do is we see the temperature change of the water. If we know the mass of the water um, and we know specific heat of water, we can figure out how much heat went from here into here. Heat flow. Heat flows. All right. So heat lost by, re by reaction. Heat lost from reaction equals heat gained from water. Heat gained from water. So we can do calorimetry in class. But we can also do calorimetry problems on paper. Woohoo! All right. Oh, look, we have water and we have an unknown metal. Okay. So if we take the unknown metal and heat it up and then put it into water that we take the temperature of, what happens to the water temp? Water temp goes up. What happens to the metal temp? Metal temp goes down. But notice this and this end up the same. Why? Because when the heat's done transferring from the metal into the water, we know it's done transferring when the temperature stops changing. Okay, so what we can find out from this is what our unknown metal is. We need to find the C of the unknown metal. So what we have to do is find the Q of the water. So heat that water takes in. And we find that by finding the mass of the water times the specific heat of water times the temperature change of water. So the mass of water is 37.5 grams. Specific heat of water is 1.00 calorie for every gram, for every degree Celsius. And the temperature change of the water is the 24.1 degree Celsius minus the 20 degree Celsius, 20.1 degree Celsius. If I multiply that all together, I get um, 150 calories. Okay, that's the heat lost, I mean heat gained by water. But where did water get its heat? The heat of the metal is going to be equal to the heat of the water. Why? Metal lost it. Water gained it. They are equal. Woohoo! Heat lost equals heat gained. Beautiful thing. So now I know the Q of the metal is going to be 150 calories. How do I know? Because this e that equals that. Okay? So now, if I want to know something else about the metal, like its specific heat, I need to know the mass of the metal, which is 86.2 grams. And I need to know the specific heat of the metal. That's what I'm trying to find. And I need to know the temperature change of the metal. So delta T for the metal is 98.9 .9 degrees minus 24.1 degrees. So I can find this C by dividing through by the 86.2 and dividing through by the 98.9 .9 minus 24.1. And when I divide that all out, I find out that um, the 86.2 and then the um, 74.8, that's the temperature change, and this is grams, and this is degrees Celsius, equals the specific heat of the metal is going to be 150 calories over grams degrees Celsius, and we're going to get 0 0.023 for the specific heat of the metal. Okay, find the specific heat of the metal, 0 0.023. All right, so then we can look at the table and see what metal it is. What is the identity of an unknown metal? All right, so we put a brown metal, we heat it to 98.4 98 degrees, and then we put in the calorimeter um, with some water. The data table above was um, obtained. So what metal could it be? All right, I'm going to save this one for class, and then we'll decide what metal it is by finding out that the heat lost by the water, heat water loss, okay, heat water gained. Because when you put a hot metal into water, it's going to gain heat, is the heat lost by the metal. Okay. So we have an MC delta T for the water, and an MC delta T for the metal, and then we just have to plug these in and find out what's missing. We'll do it in class. Okay. Oh, look, here's another example. Hey, compound A is burning a bomb calorimeter. So we have 2,500 2, grams of water. That's the mass. Um, the compound causes the temperature of the water to go from 10 to 55 degrees. That's a 45 degree delta T. Okay. How much heat was produced by compound A? Well, compound A's heat is going to be equal to comp is going to be equal to water's gain. Okay, heat loss be water gain. So, if we know um, how much heat water takes in, we know how much heat the metal loses. So we can use the water's mass 
you can use the water specific heat. And this time I'm going to use 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius because that's the specific heat of water. And we're going to use a 45 degree temperature change. We find out that there was 470,250 joules of heat lost by reaction. Okay. All right. So we can use calorimetry because the heat lost by one thing is equal to the heat gained by another. Woohoo! So to review, boiling point depends on vapor pressure and atmospheric pressure. Temperature is constant during phase change. Evaporation is not boiling. Calorimetry is a technique uh, that we can use to measure and calculate heat transfer. Heat loss equals heat gained. Woohoo! Q equals Q. So hopefully you can do all this. And this is it, folks. Peace out from Harvard.